Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Bryant from the University of New South Wales in Australia. And it's great to be here at this uh, Amygdala conference. Um, it's got a great name, this conference. And it's my first chance to actually talk at it. So um, I'm talking to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, so I can't uh, obviously be uh, over in the States physically at the moment. Like legally, I could be, but I'm not. But I'm now going to go to my screen share and actually start um, presenting my uh, talk. Okay, and away we go. And what I'm going to talk about are the neural mechanisms of PTSD, or some of them, and what their implications are for treating PTSD. And just um, to, to get it on, on the page, what I'm actually talking about, this is my take-home message for this talk. And it is that, that PTSD is a very, very complex construct. I think it's much more complex than we often think it is, and we assume it is, <laughs> probably that we want it to be. Um, but really, the neural models that we have at the moment and the, and the paradigms that we're adopting really need to accommodate this. And they're, they're really, I don't think, accommodating it properly. And I think if we're, as a field, going to move forward, and this has got big implications for treatment, um, we probably need a, a much more nuanced approach. So I'm going to start off by talking about some of the basics. And then what I'm planning to do for, for most of this talk is to cover some of the research we've been doing or analyses we've been doing just in the last couple of years um, that sort of address a couple of these points. Now, I'm probably talking to the, the converter here. This is like uh, Psych 101. Um, in terms of the, the main model that we have of PTSD, obviously, is based on, on classical conditioning. So just in case there's anybody who doesn't quite know this model, um, if we put a rat into a chamber in a, in a learning paradigm and we give it a, a mild shock and then we put a light on at the same time, um, the rat is going to learn something very important. It's going to learn that that light is actually a trigger of a subsequent harmful event because it's associated the shock with the light. And the next time we put that rat back in the chamber and we don't shock it, but we just turn the light on, then it's going to have a lot of fear because it's expecting the shock to happen. And what we see in rats is, in fact, what we see in humans when they're in a fearful situation, um, they freeze, there's potentiated startle, heart rate, blood pressure increases, and all the stress hormones get released. Now, the PTSD model has, has taken this classical conditioning uh, paradigm on with gusto. Essentially, the electric shock that the rat cops, that's very much what we conceptualize as the um, unconditioned stimulus, which is the trauma. It could be the rape or the war. The fear that we have as humans is the rat's fright. Now, the light that uh, is subsequently shown to the rat when it's put back in the chamber, they're all the, the, the reminders that people after trauma might experience. It could be the, the car accident victim having a um, car backfiring, or rather a soldier, I should say, in battle, um, who's associated loud noises with trauma, uh, could react when there's a, a, a loud noise, like a, a car backfiring. Um, and when these reminders happen, whereas the rat reacts fear to the light, um, we as humans have all our re-experiencing symptoms. And most typically we have you know, intrusive memories, flashbacks, um, distress, when we are exposed to those reminders because we're expecting the, the trauma to happen again because we've learned those associations. Now, the other key ingredient in this equation, of course, is extinction learning. Of course, we know that if we put a rat back in the chamber um, repeatedly, we're not shocking it anymore, um, but we keep sh shining the light on, uh, the rat is going through new learning and it's learning that the light is actually signaling safety. And that doesn't undo the initial learning, but what it does, it inhibits it. And so it's learning that this light now is a, is a signal of safety and it can learn that um, I don't need to expect a shock anymore. And essentially, this is the major model we have for how people often adapt after trauma. So for most of us, we 
uh, undergo extinction learning in the weeks and the months after trauma because we will have hundreds and hundreds of trials, if you like, of exposure to reminders, but there's no adverse outcome. So the, the soldier can hear cars backfiring or the, the rape victim can, can meet men who aren't assaulting her. And each time this happens, there's new learning that these reminders are no longer triggers of threat. And so this is often why we conceptualize how in the period after trauma, whereas initially many people will have post-traumatic stress reactions, subsequent to that, um, the PTSD symptoms abate over time, generally speaking. Um, it's not that simple, of course, but it's because there is extinction learning happening as time goes on. Now, because of uh, so much of the parallel between the sort of the, the PTSD response in humans and, and fear conditioning and extinction in rats, we've been able to map the neurobiology of the conditioning very well, and hence by extrapolation to PTSD. And in essence, the, the basic mechanism is that conditioning is very much happening in the basolateral nucleus of the amygdala, very deep in the brain. So all the, the sounds, the smells, etc., all the different stimuli, they get associated with the uh, response. So the, the fear, the discomfort, the pain. And that's where the conditioning occurs. And then there are projections to the central nucleus of the amygdala, and that's actually where the conditioned response, the fear, yeah, then projects. And then we have the, the fear responses. And this is a critical component of it. Now, when it comes to PTSD, this has led to a very, very, for many years, I think a rather simplistic model of PTSD, where it was essentially that we have hyperreactivity in PTSD in the amygdala. And there was impoverished uh, medial prefrontal cortex inhibition um, of the amygdala. Um, now, this is important in terms of the medial prefrontal cortex is, is central to um, extinction learning. Um, it's basically one of the in, the, in this prefrontal cortex area at the front of the brain, it uh, has a top down function in inhibiting um, lower order. Uh, arousal, particularly in the amygdala. Now, if we actually look at meta-analyses of PTSD, in fact, probably one of the most robust findings is we do tend to have impoverished medial prefrontal cortex um, activity. But the expected finding that we would actually have hypo, hyperactive amygdala um, response in PTSD is actually not found. It's not a very robust finding. It's quite mixed. But generally, this is the model that has prevailed really for decades. And whilst there is some parsimony in it, and there's certainly utility in it, it really doesn't tell the story. And really where the, the field has been moving in recent years is recognizing that we need to accommodate that the brain is a really complex organ, and it's not these, there's not simply these two uh, networks involved. And this is a, um, a graphic that I like. It's something put together by Arik Shalev, um, Israel Leverson, and, and Charlie Marmo in a, in a paper in the New England Journal. It actually wasn't a neuroscience paper. It was just a summary of PTSD, but they summarized the neural models this way. And it was actually, I think, um, you know, a nice model because you can see here that they do talk about about the various functions that we have, that we see dysfunctions in PTSD. There is the emotion regulation and executive function um, factors that involve the, the, the medial prefrontal cortex. We've got the, the threat and salience detection functions, which are very much the insula and the anterior cingulate and the amygdala. Uh, associated with that is the fear learning, obviously, with, with similar. Um, functions, particularly in the, in the amygdala and the subfields of the amygdala. And critically, we've got contextual processing, um, which obviously you know, centrally involves the hippocampus, but also the thalamus, and again, the medial prefrontal cortex. And, and what you're starting to see here is that there is 
a lot of different networks and they're not happening in isolation. There's an interaction involved here. And we're starting to realize, and if we actually look clinically at PTSD, we're understanding that it's not all just about the fear response, but there's a lot of other dysfunctions in PTSD in terms of executive functioning, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to understand how do all of these things interact? How do they maintain the condition and how do they impact on treatment? So let me sort of under, um, start to talk about some of the, the empirical work that we've done in recent times. The study that we've done recently, we were just trying to take this approach of trying to understand the, the complex brain, given the, the previous comments. Now, rather than just studying regions, of course, people in, uh, studying PTSD have been looking at connectivity between regions um, you know, for many, many years. And typically, what we do in connectivity is we look at um, resting state of the brain. And what most studies have done in PTSD have found alterations in the connectivity between what's called the default mode network and the salience network, and to a lesser extent, the um, executive control network. This sort of approach is quite limited, though, because the way our researchers do it is they typically do a region of interest uh, analysis, identify the seeds. Um, where there are significant activations. And then from there, they look at where are projections to other parts of the brain. But that's really not taking in the whole brain because it's already starting off by focusing on those specific significant regions. Other studies have tried to look at the whole brain by, by taking a graph theory-based approach. And there's a strength of this because it actually does capture brain-wide functional interactions. Limitations of, of that approach is that it doesn't really capture the strength of the associations. So what we, we try to do here, we try to use what's called a, a network-based statistics approach, because this actually captures the strength and also the extent of the connections. And what we did here is we looked at 138 people. And I should say one of the things about this particular, all the studies I'm going to talk about, they're all done on one scanner. And that was nice because we could actually have confidence of uh, comparability between um, the images that we're getting on, on, on people. Um, 138 people and uh, half of them had PTSD and the other half were controls, a mixture of trauma and uh, non-trauma controls. And what we did was we um, looked, ended up identifying 438 brain regions in, in eight key networks. Now, let me just explain this, this um, PowerPoint in, in, in English. What essentially we found was that the PTSD patients had lower intrinsic functional connectivity in a network of over 200 connections between 420 regions, both within and between a range of networks, including the, the default node, central executive, limbic, visual, and um, somatomotor regions, and they also had a higher connectivity across a network of 50 connections between thalamic and limbic to sensory and default modes. And what was interesting about this whole pattern of findings was that we found the trauma controls sat equally between the, the connectivity levels of the PTSD and the non-exposed, non-trauma controls, suggesting that trauma controls actually are affected but not like those that actually go on to develop PTSD. So if we wanted to, to sum this up, essentially what it's saying is there was hypo-connectivity, reduced connectivity um, in, in cortical networks in PTSD, but hyper-connectivity, that is exaggerated connectivity in the subcortical and limbic networks. And, and this probably suggests an imbalance between subcortical and, and limbic inputs, and also the higher cortical networks. And this is really starting to map out really what's happening at a, at a brain-wide level and is showing that PTSD is, is doing something different. Now, another approach we've been taking in the last couple of years is trying to understand PTSD in relation to a lot of its um, disorders that are very, very comparable to PTSD. Because we know the com comorbidity between PTSD and other disorders is 
is huge, um, at least 50%. And very often when we, we look at studies of PTSD, we most of them are looking at it, the disorder in relation to um, trauma controls or healthy controls. But given the symptom composition of PTSD, that's very misleading because there's a lot of comorbidity and we under, need to understand what is the actual phenotype. Now, one of the, the new candidates on the block at the moment is, is complex PTSD. Now, this is not a disorder recognized by DSM yet. There was a lot of argy-bargy about uh, in DSM-5 committees about whether to, to recognize it, but ICD-11 certainly has recognized it and it's getting a lot of attention internationally. And there's many studies validating the uh, uniqueness of this disorder. And essentially how it's characterized is, is having PTSD. But in addition, you've got um, disturbances in what um, ICD calls self-organization. And really it's, it centers around deficits in emotion regulation, interpersonal relationships, and a sense of oneself uh, having a healthy identity. What we did here, we had, to date there were no uh, studies on complex PTSD. So we wanted to ask the question, does complex PTSD actually have a different neural profile than PTSD? So we looked at 99 people. I don't know why, but in nearly all our studies, we aim to get 100, but we can never find that final person. We always end up with 99. Um, we end up with 99 people. And they were divided by people with uh, complex PTSD, PTSD, and trauma controls. And people um, were tested during fMRI um, um, during presentation of uh, threatening or uh, different valence faces, um, neutral faces, angry, fearful, disgust, etc. And essentially what we found here is that um, the complex PTSD people were distinct in that they had increased activation of the left insula and the right insula and the right amygdala relative to people with PTSD, whilst we were superliminally presenting um, the uh, threatening stimuli. Now, this is interesting because it does say for the first time, this is a distinct pattern of uh, neural responding in people with complex uh, PTSD. And when we're talking about the insula and, and these particular networks, we are really talking about a disturbance of those networks involved in emotion regulation and also self-referential processing, um, which is consistent with the conceptualization of uh, complex PTSD. Now, it's very common in people with um, complex PTSD to have um, high levels of dissociation uh, because these people tend to have uh, PTSD after childhood abuse or very, very severe trauma. And essentially, we found a, a significant correlation between the degree of dissociation that people had and the activation of the uh, right insula. And again, this is consistent with the notion that these people would have impairments in self-referential processing, et cetera, which again highlights you know, one of the key mechanisms that we see going on with people with complex presentations. Now, another disorder that you know, we've been looking at lately, which is often overlapping with PTSD. Um, oh, sorry, before I get onto that, we should talk about inhibition, another paradigm with complex PTSD. We looked at inhibition in this, in this group of people because impulsivity is a major problem in this, in this uh, group. Uh, Self-harm um, and impulsive behaviors are very, very common. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap between complex PTSD and borderline, even though many studies tell us that they are distinct disorders. But there is that self-harm and impulsivity profile is, is common between them. So we wanted to look at this. So what we did was we, we looked at 30 people with complex PTSD, 40 people with PTSD and 40 healthy controls. And we uh, studied them on a go-no-go no go task. Now, the go-no-go task is, is the standard paradigm used um, to study um, response inhibition. And essentially, in this, in this task, somebody actually has a, a series of um, signals, and they're told to either to press or to, to not press, depending on the color of the um, instruction. Um, 
and most of the time they're pressing, but um, then periodically they're not pressing. And uh, the colour in which the word press um, appears um, is telling them whether to press or not press. And this is the most validated measure of um, response inhibition because we get into the habit of, you know, go, 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 you know, you're constantly pressing and then suddenly, you know, something is coming up telling you to not, not go, um, then uh, it's very hard to sort of inhibit that impulse to just keep the, the pressing going. So it's a very standard response inhibition task. And uh, we did this whilst they were in the scanner. And essentially what we found here was that the people with PTSD had lower activation in the left thalamus during the no-go um, tasks relative to both the PTSD and the controls. And, and this is important because thalamus is um, strongly implicated in inhibition. And it's consistent with this notion that people with complex PTSD do have this deficit in being able to inhibit. You know, they're not able to sort of recruit the thalamus to that extent. Now, one of the other conditions that um, we've been uh, looking at is um, traumatic grief. And again, this is a recently recognized um, disorder. Um, it's characterized by um, persistent longing and yearning for somebody who's died. Very commonly co uh, coexists with um, PTSD, but also depression. Recognized by ICD 11. Uh, it's actually rejected by DSM-5, but DSM-5-TR um, has now come late to the party and uh, they now have also uh, recognised prolonged grief. And DSM-5-TR is recognising it pretty much identically as ICD-11. Um, it's it's centering on this distinct on this sort of longing for the deceased, and because it's it's conceptualised as longing for the deceased, it's very much uh, seen as a dysfunction in reward processing, because as distinct from PTSD, which is very much avoidance, um, there's a strong argument to be made, and there's empirical evidence to be made that grief is actually can be distinguished by avoidance, but also it's an approach or reward processing. Um, disorder because I'm I'm yearning and longing for the thing that 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 is gone. So what we did in this study, we tested 117 people, a mixture of people with grief, prolonged grief disorder, PTSD, major depression, and uh, bereaved control. And we put them in the scanner, and they will again watch the threatening faces um, paradigm, and they're watching either happy or sad faces. And what we found here was that the people with prolonged grief had greater activation in a, in a number of networks, but included the pregenial anterior cingulate, the bilateral insula, bilateral dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, right chordate, and also there was greater connectivity between the um, perigenial anterior cingulate and the right pallidum whilst they were watching happy faces. Now, happy faces, that's an interesting finding because that is uh, tapping more into positive or reward processing. Now, the, P the prolonged grief people were distinct to both the PTSD and the depression people in terms of recruitment of the medial orbiter frontal cortex during subliminal processing of sad faces. The grief people were also distinct to depression, but not PTSD in terms of greater activation of the left amygdala the chordate, and the putamen during sad faces. Now, wrapping all of this up, what this tells us is that what we're seeing distinctly here in grief is that there is a uh, dis dysfunction of reward circuits, but also there is um, overlap with PTSD in terms of having disturbances of um, salience um, and threat um, networks. And this is consistent with the notion that what we see in, in uh, grief, there is a lot of overlap with PTSD, but there is also that uh, that element that is distinctive to it. And that does tap into the, these disturbed reward processes. But it's not totally distinct. There is an awful lot of overlap. Now, one of the things that we are always trying to look out for as well is the role of trauma itself as distinct from PTSD. And, and it's something that we do need to constantly be aware of because 
there's quite a bit in the in the literature that if you look closely, it really does suggest that going through trauma itself impacts on brain function. And often, you know, we do think about how PTSD, you know, is distinct, but we need to actually understand PTSD as distinct from the role of trauma. And how we define the trauma is actually, you know, really important because obviously there's trauma and trauma. And how you define who is a trauma control. Going back to the earlier study, for example, that I spoke about, uh, about complex PTSD, that was actually a very hard study to do in terms of finding trauma controls because it's the nature of complex PTSD that the vast majority of them, and this is well documented in the literature, are victims of childhood, prolonged childhood abuse. But trying to find people without any psychiatric problems, but are also survivors of prolonged childhood abuse is actually very difficult to recruit. Obviously, there's a lot of them out there, but recruiting them for studies is very, very hard. And so you get an imbalance about, you know, what is a comparable level of trauma control, because looking at a bunch of people with complex PTSD with childhood abuse versus trauma controls, but they've all been through car accidents is really not um, a fair comparison. And it's an issue methodologically that I think you know, we always need to be sensitive to. But we try to look at it in this particular study where we've been doing uh, over the years a, a lot of work with refugees. And this is a group that has distinct trauma exposure. Because in this particular sample of 99, we couldn't get to 100. Um, what we did was um, this group was pretty much distributed equally between those who had actually been through torture as, as properly defined by interpersonal interrogatory abuse and, and non-torture. And we, and, and we just looked at, at just their data in terms of resting state. And what we found in this study, an important point to notice first up, is that we did control for PTSD symptoms. So, you know, we can take the PTSD symptoms out of the story. And what we found that was that the torture group had greater positive functional connectivity between the left central executive network and the anterior dorsomedial default mode network, and also the anterior ventromedial default mode network relative to the people who were not trauma exposed. And the trauma people also had greater negative functional connectivity between the central executive and the lateral frontal networks and the anterior dorsal medial. So what this study is telling us is that people who are exposed to trauma, they do have affected functional co connectivity between both within and between core intrinsic brain networks. And th these are, you know, mapping sort of pointing to disrupted connectivity in key metacognitive and self-referential emotional pr processing systems. Um, and, and this really is suggesting that just being without a consideration of PTSD, being exposed to something like torture is actually, and this has happened, I should say, many years earlier before they had come to Australia, um, were having a long-term impact on their neural functioning as a result simply of the, of the torture. Because clearly when you talk about the functional disruption that people like refugees have, um, what we're seeing here in terms of the disturbed functional connectivity between these regions, it, it is actually highly relevant to the sort of functions we see at a clinical level. Now, ultimately, the reason we do a lot of our neural investigation is we are trying to understand how to treat people better. Now, I mentioned earlier that I talked about extinction learning. And without doubt, the treatment of choice for PTSD is what can loosely be called trauma-focused psychotherapy or trauma-focused cognitive behaviour therapy. And it's based a lot on exposure therapy where we um, repeatedly expose the, the PTSD patient to memories of the trauma and to other reminders. Um, and it's very much based on, a, on an extinction learning model. Now, it's the best treatment we've got, but if we're honest, only 50, maybe 60% of people actually respond to this treatment. And to be honest, we've been at that mark for decades, we really haven't improved on it. So the question is, how can we improve that? And can we use neuroimaging to understand 
how we might improve it. And particularly what a lot of studies have been doing is trying to understand what predicts treatment response. So let me sort of talk a bit about that and, and tell you about some of the studies we've done. Now, this is a, a series of studies that we did with some patients that went through trauma-focused CBT in my center. And here we've got 40 patients. Um, and before they started CBT, which was 11 to 12 sessions, and it, these always involved a, um, exposure th therapy. They were independently assessed for PTSD before and after. Um, and uh, here we've got a paradigm where they uh, did a reappraisal. Now, reappraisal is essential in cognitive behavior therapy um, because essentially the way you know it, it, CBT works is that I am activating trauma memories, but I'm then in a sense, doing cognitive restructuring to reappraise the memories and their interpretations and what they mean for me in the here and now. And this is the, you know, boiling it down very simply, this is how CBT works. Um, and this is similar to uh, reappraisal tasks, in a sense, that we often use um, in, in something like a, a scanner. And it very much follows, it follows the old James Gross model of reappraisal. And a, Essentially, the way this works is that you know, someone's sitting in the scanner and they'll see uh, an instruction to think or watch. And what we do is before we get into the scanner, they are taught that when they see an image of an instruction to think, whatever they're about to see, they're meant to reappraise it. And we instruct them on how to reappraise, such as if you're seeing something nasty, imagine you're a film director and, and you're just uh, creating a scene. And it's not really sort of, you're not watching the real thing. Whereas in a watch condition, you're actually seeing it and experiencing it as you normally would. And then what we would do before, they would see you know, various scenes, either positive or negative, and then they would rate it um, you know, um, on a button press in terms of just uh, you know, how negative it is, and they'd see positive or negative scenes, et cetera. What we essentially found was that during reappraisal, um, before treatment, those patients, the better they were able to reappraise in terms of having a reduced amygdala response, which is what we would want to see during reappraisal because I'm down-regulating my amygdala. That actually predicted people who after treatment had a greater reduction in their, in their PTSD severity. And that makes sense because this is what, you know, the, the greater my capacity to, to, to down to have reduced arousal, that's what hopefully what I'm doing in CVT. But when we looked at the watch, um, conditions, we found that increased amygdala and hippocampus um, activity um, during the watch conditions also predicted a positive response. And this is also consistent because what we also need in CBT is when I'm, I need to be able to activate my emotions. I need to access them. And so if I can actually access the amygdala and I can actually experience the emotions that I'm needing to experience. I'm not trying to reappraise here, remember, I'm just watching it. That's also what we need people to do. So combining being able to access emotions, but also to be able to downregulate during reappraisal, in a sense, these are the two components that we need to be able to have a good response. The people who aren't able to do that, these are the ones who aren't responding that well to this treatment. What we've also found is that there's a, a lot of evidence that PTSD is not uniform. PTSD symptoms can be clustered. There's been a lot of factor analysis um, obviously done of PTSD, but symptoms can tend to be clustered into fear or dysphoric symptoms. And these are what they basically look like. And it's pretty obvious that the dysphoric ones, these are the ones that overlap a lot with depression. Um, and, and these are all symptoms of PTSD. We've done a series of studies where we've been looking at these um, trying to look at treatment response of the different types of symptoms of PTSD, not just PTSD as a whole. Um, because the PTSD treatments, they do focus on fear typically. So we, we tested 40 PTSD patients, gave them the, the fear face processing during the scanner. Um, and what we found was that activating the insula predicted greater reduction of fear symptoms, but not greater reduction of dysphoric symptoms. And that's consistent with what you know, we would expect because this is, this is the insula, is, is, is part of the salience detection uh, network. 
and we ex we would expect that and the fear learning network and we would expect that to be predictive and and similar uh, as you'd expect greater connectivity of the insula with the ACC you know was predicting fear reduction which is consistent with that top down process when we looked um, at something like inhibition or executive control we can see a, a, a slightly different story same sort of paradigm and here we uh, did the go no go task again and essentially what we found here this is a very complicated powerpoint i apologize for that but essentially what we're seeing this is complicated because we also used eeg but I, I might not go into that it's going to complicate the story too much but we found that reduced activation in the left precuneus and the right superior parietal cortex predicted greater improvement in dysphoric symptoms but it did not predict um, a reduction in the fear symptoms. And this is important because the frontoparietal network is strongly involved in, in response inhibition. We know that PTSD is deficient in this particular skill and this particular network. Um, and also depression is. And so it's not a coincidence that it's the, this is actually, this deficiency is predicting response of uh, dysphoric symptoms, but, but not the fear symptoms. And in a sense, this again is sort of highlighting the need to be able to look more nuanced, um, in a more nuanced way at PTSD phenotypes rather than just the global PTSD um, symptomatology, because it's really not mapping onto the neural networks that well if we do the, the latter. We've also tried to look at it using the whole brain uh, connectome, um, as we started talking about earlier. Um, we looked at 36 patients, prior to, to CBT. And essentially what we found here was that um, when we looked at uh, 343 brain regions, we found that lower connectivity on across a, a number of networks, um, but without sort of going through the whole list, because there's a lot of them. Let me just summarize it by saying, connectivity both within and between brain networks associated with external vigilance, self-awareness and cognitive control before treatment, that was actually <clears throat> characterized by a positive response to, to, to trauma-focused CBT. So this greater connectivity, um, you know, while this does at a whole brain level seems to be important for treatment response. And of course, the, there's the issue of white matter integrity, you know, which is like the building blocks. Um, and so obviously we uh, have also looked at diffusion uh, tensor imaging to see how does this predict treatment response. And again, to, to cut a long, long story short, because I just realized I'm running out of time, what we found was that greater improvement in dysphoric symptoms, not fear, but was found, and I'm not sure why we, we found the dysphoric symptoms and not the fear symptoms in this, in this study, but greater improvement in dysphoric symptoms after treatment was associated with um, lower fractional um, anisotropy in the white matter in a, in a large number of fibers. And particularly, I'd say that the fibers that we found them on, including the cingulum bundle and the fornix and the stria terminalis, they are all got outflow tracks linked to the anterior cingulate and the amygdala. And obviously, these are, are tracks that are involved in networks in the formation of emotional memories. And I think we need to do a lot more work on, on DTI and treatment response because we really don't know enough about how white matter you know, can uh, link to, uh, to treatment. Okay, I'm nearing the end. I just want to make some key points here about sort of where the field is at at the moment and where we need to be heading. As I started to allude in this talk, the neural data is telling us that looking at PTSD in a, an overall way is simplistic. Just looking at something as gross as fear versus dysphoric, which is very, very simplistic too, um, is showing us different findings. A study that Isaac Galitz-Levy and I did years ago, you know, just looked at the combination of PTSD symptoms in DSM-5 and found that you can actually, in terms of the different combinations of all the different symptoms and clusters, there's over 636,000 ways you can actually have PTSD. Now, We've tested this recently with the Army STARS data. What we did when we looked at, at that data, we found over 3,500 uh, troops met criteria for PTSD, but of them, there are over 2,000 over 2, different patterns of symptoms 
But of that 3,500, nearly 2,000 people had a unique presentation of PTSD. That, that was 55% of them. More importantly, over 1,100 had PTSD over two sub, uh, successive assessments. And what we found was that um, 90%, even though they had PTSD, they had different symptoms at the second assessment than they did at the first. Now, what this tells us is that we shouldn't just be taking PTSD as a single construct. It's much more complex than that. There are tons of different phenotypes that anybody can present with. And if we're trying to understand a neural marker or a treatment predictor marker, we're being very, very simplistic by simply looking at it in the context of PTSD or not PTSD. We need to understand the specific phenotypes. And this also spills over to the treatment area. Because at the moment, because the field has been dominated by the, um, the extinction models, the fear learning models, nearly all the attempts to augment exposure therapy have focused on extinction models. Over the years, we've seen things like uh, decycloserine, ehimbine, hydrocortisone, and what's, everybody, what's got everybody very excited at the moment is MDMA as ways of uh, you know, augmenting it. But to be honest, if we look at the data, all these attempts have actually led to very limited success. Now, one possibility of this is that the failure of um, these augmenting effects of treatment may be that it's not all about fear and extinction. And just to highlight that, we've recently just done uh, this massive meta-analysis of all treatment studies of trauma-focused psychotherapy. Um, we found 128 trials which yielded over 250 effect sizes. And when we tried to look at and calculate what was the strength of the, what are the predictors of treatment response, extinction and fear category of predictors was good. It actually had a decent effect size, which validates these approaches you know, that we've been talking about. But many of the other predictors had nothing to do with fear, things like trauma-related factors, executive function, depression cognitive factors, social support, non-fear-based emotions. All of these contributed to whether somebody would respond or not to treatment. Now, this also speaks to the neural models that we need to be looking more broadly than just a narrow fear extinction circuitry paradigm because PTSD is a bigger animal than that and we need to be able to accommodate that in our, in our treatments. So let me wind up. I think we've got a, a long way to go with understanding and treating PTSD. And as I've said a few times, I think it needs a more nuanced approach to if we're really going to sort of accommodate the complexity of what we see in PTSD. Um, and really it's only by doing this that I think we can try to get more targeted treatments um, that can really sort of focus on the different subtypes of PTSD. So I will stop there and uh, thanks for your attention.